Hey guys. Um, so welcome once again, my name is Wayne Morgan. Um, and, uh, when we were having a conversation about April being volunteer appreciation month, I don't know if you know that or not. Um, but it's a great time in youth ministry because there's a, I don't know if you feel the summer or the spring slump, you know, like kids aren't coming out. So it gives us a great time to kind of lean into our volunteers and do something special. And as we were talking about that, Charlie's name came up. And if you don't know Charlie, Google her. She's a real big deal. But we want you to know Charlie as, as a coach and a friend and a mentor. So we invited her here just to talk through um, uh, what, it's, what it's like to encourage volunteers. She has a lot of experience with this. Um, but Charlie, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your schedule and joining us this morning. Um, or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what if, um, what do you, what are you, uh, who is Charlie Condor? <laughs> oh, that is a complicated question. But uh, yeah, I was a deaf and hard of hearing teacher uh, and an adjunct professor teaching American Sign Language for many years and felt really called into youth ministry. I've been in youth ministry now for 20 I think it's my 26th year. Um, I'm a mom of two grown kids. Uh, they are 25. So we're adultish in my house, we call it. Uh, it's a it's an interesting place to be. Um, and I am the lead coach for the organization called the Youth Cartel. I get to coach amazing youth workers across the globe, which I love. Um, cause sometimes I think I get in my head at my own church that this is just like, just a local problem. And it's so interesting when you're on a call with a youth worker in New Zealand and the problem is the same, mm -hmm. um, nobody's got volunteers. So apparently there's a shortage, uh, worldwide. And I also serve at orange on the orange students team where I get to create some really, um, great content. And I serve in my local church, uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia with the young adults ministry. That is awesome. And for those of you who are, you know, sort of on the fence about orange, you're, you would like to go, but you know, you're like, uh, if there was a discount code, we're going to drop a discount code in the chat. Don't Google it or don't just post it on, you know, your favorite social media. Um, but for you guys that are here, we're dropping that in. Charlie's brought that for us 20% off. Also, if you do go to orange, make sure you go to Charlie's breakout. So what's your breakout on this year? Guys, I am so excited about my breakout because we live in a world that is curated for us, right? Like everything I'm wearing came off an Instagram ad that was directed towards me. Everything, even my Spotify playlist has an AI DJ and plays all the music that they know that I love. But in a world where everything is so customizable, I'm worried that we're doing youth ministry and is this one size fits most model. And so I would love to help you rethink how we are being students of students and personalize ministry, because I don't know about y'all, but I have a hard time getting college students to leave their dorm room to come to worship and to come to something at the church, but I'm hosting something at a coffee shop. 75 of them will show up. Why is that? So I'm kind of like working through that myself. And so while I think my workshop is really good, um, gosh, I think it's a great conversation we could all have together. <laughs> now I want you to talk about that instead of volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll just leave it for those of you who are going orange. And then maybe, you know, after Charlie writes her book about it, we'll have her back. I don't know. So, <laughs> so uh, Charlie, uh, as we're th thinking about volunteers and appreciating them and encouraging volunteers, uh, just we did a podcast that will drop next week, but uh, we wanted to have a conversation with people. We think that in-person conversations have more impact sometimes than listening to a podcast. So everybody will break out into small groups in a little bit. But what would you what would you like to encourage us as we're thinking about volunteers? What are some things that we need to just kind of lean into? Because the church is run by volunteers. And so how do we manage them well? Yes. Oh my God. 
gosh. Okay. I, uh, this is my hot take. I think people approach volunteers as the scared ask when it's really this beautiful opportunity to walk with a student as they began to figure out their faith journey and who God is for them. So sometimes the asks are not big enough and I don't know about y'all, but sometimes we can be control freaks when it comes to how we want to do ministry. No, no, no. It's better done this way. Oh, no, no, no. It's better if we say it this way. But the reality is, um, there's some really great people that we need to empower and to let them lead the way that they lead best because what you do is for you and let them be them and y'all and just trust them. Also in that trust process, uh, you need to be really careful about your onboarding process. I think onboarding volunteers mm -hmm. is the number one thing to do to, for retention and to make sure they're in the right place so that they can lead at the best capacity they have. So when you're talking about onboarding, um, is that a different space that every church has a different onboarding process? Or what would you think about as like hot things for people to really lean into when they talk about onboarding? Yeah. So if I said onboarding process and you went, what the heck is that? Then we probably should have a bigger conversation, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I've been at churches, I've served at churches and they were like, well, if they say yes, they're in. And I'm always like, well, let's pump the brakes. That's not an all gas conversation for me. Um, because one, to me to onboard, it's training them. I want to know about them and their story to figure out where they fit best. Because for me to be a small group leader is to sit in a circle and a pastor students. That is different than being the pizza pastor outer, which is still different than the person who's the greeter, right? And so to me, there's like this volunteer funnel, right? And you have the pizza passer outers up here, but the small group leaders are down here. And so it's really being particular about your ass, making sure you have job descriptions. And I keep, um, I was in the same church for like almost 15 years and it's a medium sized church. Uh, we worship maybe 400 people, but my middle school ministry was like tapping out at 275 kids. So when I say it took the whole church to make student ministry happen, it really took the whole church. And we're talking about people who have not um, sat in a circle with urban uh, kids in a minute and maybe ever. Um, and so I think that onboarding process is what will save you a lot of hurt in the long run. Um, but being very specific about that onboarding process. And so, so there's like, you have to think through what you do for youth group to actually give like job descriptions that are kind of boring. Is that what I'm hearing? Like the pizza passer router? <laughs> yeah, the pizza passer router, but they own it. I, right. I don't have to worry about what food is that week. They've contacted restaurants in our area. They have relationships with local restaurants and people, and they make the food happen every week, regardless. Yeah. Um, I once had to have an emergency kidney surgery and was out for six weeks. Can you imagine 275 middle schoolers running wild on your church campus? And I was panicked and the best, uh, it hurt, it kind of hurt me. It, my ego was hurt. I'm not going to lie. But the best thing I got from one of my interns was like, to be honest, Miss Charlie, nobody even knows you're not here. And I was like, cool. So like, but that was fantastic. That's like, I got to tuck my ego, right? Because I trained speakers. I had trained greeters, small group leaders. Everybody knew what to do. And so me being gone, nobody even missed me. Yeah, that is, I mean, really the job of us as leaders is to work ourselves out of a job, but we don't ever want to yes. get in that spot. <laughs> um uh, one of the people in the chat asked if there was examples for um, job descriptions. I dropped one that I have for our youth ministry. Um, but do you have any, Charlie, that you could uh, point us to? I have to? a ton. If you email me, I can put my email in there. It's just charlie at thinkorange.com. I can send you a bunch of job descriptions. But here's what I know. Um, it looks different to be a small group leader in my church than it does Steve's church. And it looks different to be a greeter and a pizza pass our outer in my church than it does in Wayne's church. So while we can give you these, you really need to customize them for what the need is in your ministry. Kind of like your breakout it's session. Not a copy your paste. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. it's not a copy paste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So first you got to set up the expectations. You can, you got to be able to say, this is what I need you for. And in my experience, I've, as people have graduated from like that outsider volunteer and they slowly get closer to the action. I, I don't know if mm -hmm. you've experienced that. Some are like, this is as close as I want to get to these group, this group of kids. Right. 
Yeah. And that's okay. And that's yeah. okay. We need to volunteer for every level of ministry, right? Um, I think that that's okay. If you want to always be the pizza passer outer, that's solid. But if you want to be a small group leader, um, I think the other piece of ministry is don't be afraid to ask for the commitment. Um, once you volunteer for an entire school year with me, we're going to sit and they're going to evaluate me and the ministry and I'm going to evaluate them. I, and I use like some old school y'all, cause I'm old. I use some old school, like probably came from John Maxwell, like evaluation forms, um, of each other. And we evaluate each other to make sure what you're doing is a great fit. And then the next ask is for the life of that student in the ministry. So I'm asking you to serve until they are a freshman in college and we don't stop at senior and high school friends. We take that all the way to college and we want those adults to the journey with those students the whole time. Don't be afraid to ask because some of the most beautiful things in my own life is showing up at weddings of kids that have eaten dinner at my table since sixth grade every Sunday night. Um, I love my small group kids. They, My very first group of small group kids turned 30 this year and don't think we haven't celebrated marriage, baptism of their kids. We just had an engagement. Um, and so doing life with kids since they were in sixth grade, it, it really makes me emotional y'all, because that's the beauty of having great volunteers mm -hmm. is that lifelong commitment they have to those kids. Yeah, that's so good. So you got a clarity for the volunteers that actually helps appreciate them because they know what they're doing. And then there's a commitment I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm doing the pastor thing where I'm making alliterations and I shouldn't do it for your for your uh, conversation. But <laughs> so um, in appreciating volunteers, uh, as we think about that a little bit more, what are what are some like what are some things that we should do? Obviously be students of our volunteers also. I mean, uh, yes. just going back to your breakout session, I just really want to go yeah. and have you let you loose on that. Um, but uh, what are some ways? Go ahead. No, um, I think it's my sweet spot. I love to be an encourager and I love to celebrate people. And I think you should celebrate big. And so uh, I love to show up in the most random places for my volunteers, if you want to know the truth. Um, I was telling Wayne when we we met for a podcast. I showed up at every one of my 47 volunteers homes at Christmas time because they could show off their Christmas decorations and invite me in. And we just, it was just a really great relational moment for us. Um, but I think high value is to have fun with your volunteers. Please do not negate how fun is such a value in ministry, right? Cause when you play together, it, there's just something that changes and you might have leaders like, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I don't know that I want to go play laser tag with you. Uh, I'm 68 years old and that doesn't seem like something I'd want to do. And I'd be like, absolutely. You want to play laser tag because you've never played laser tag. So let's roll. And so having a high value on fun, I love that so much, but I think there's other ways. Um, I love a handwritten note. And when you are a student of your volunteers, like when you know who they are, I can be out in a bookstore and I'll just pick up a book and I will send it to one of my volunteers and be like, I remember you told me that you liked such and such. Mm -hmm. Hey, I saw this book at a bookstore and thought about you. I mean, there's so many ways if you're leading in a personal way, right? Like if it's not just a warm body in your space and it's a volunteer that you care deeply for, the best thing you can do is be personal with them. Yes. Everybody loves a cup. Okay. I get it. Everybody loves a cup. Cool. But <laughs> there's so many other ways that we can love on our teammates. Uh, Charlie, it sounds like you are, you have the pastoral gift and some of us, instead of going to school to be a pastor, we went to school to be a speaker. And so this is like, scary for us right like we we went to school to perform <laughs> so the conversation about you know encouraging youth leaders could be like outside of our wheelhouse a little bit maybe that's why we don't have volunteers um so as a natural born encourager shepherd what are some other things that we could think about to encourage volunteers um i had every one of my volunteers to my house for dinner. I think there's something special when you invite people into your home. What you need to know about me is I don't have a big home. 
<laughs> but I borrowed every table from the fellowship hall at my church and all the chairs. And I just set up a beautiful banquet in my house for every person to have a seat around the table, place mm. cards. It was so sweet. But here's the thing. Inviting people into your home changes things because it when does. you're invited to someone's space, that is the best thing that you can do because you feel so valued that you've been invited into your home. I don't know about you, but like when your senior pastor invites you over for dinner, um, that means something to you, right? And so sharing that meal is so important. So having people to your home, I think is one of the best things you can do for your leaders. That is, it is so right. Cause I did campus ministry for years and I tell people all the time doing campus ministry where we met in students' homes is way mm -hmm. different than people meeting at the church. And you yes. get the, the bonds that those students had with each other it excelled beyond what we could do in youth group, even for missions trips sometimes. So yeah, yeah there's an intimacy there. Yeah. That's just phenomenal. And there, there's a time and place for trainings. Like I don't, I love a training, right? But if a training can be an email, I'll make it an email or I just record myself and like send people like funny quips, like, Hey, here's this this week. But I think when you invite people to celebrate them, it should truly be a celebration. Mm, yeah, for sure. Uh, you all know how we can be with a side agenda, right? <laughs> Why don't, can you talk a little bit about that for me? <laughs> okay. Because you're inviting people to something, but you already, and you're like asking for their input and their ideas and all these things. And the whole time in your head, you already know how you want it to go. You already have decided all the things. And that's a side agenda to me. Don't invite me to a meeting where you already have figured out the answers because you're not really valuing my time and my opinions. So I highly suggest that when you're inviting volunteers to brainstorm, to train and do all the things, really listen to them. Like allow them to evaluate your ministry because through your eyes, you may be killing it or you may think it's like terrible and your volunteers are like, no, it's the best thing I've ever been a part of. Don't be scared of allowing them to have a voice about what you're doing. Mm. Yeah, but that's a scary part for us control freaks that only went to school to control things, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you a question that probably is maybe a little bit outside of like your experience, but a lot of what we deal with with network coordinators, the majority of people that are on this are coordinating networks. And we're trying to appreciate volunteer youth leaders that aren't a part of our ministry. We see them volunteering, struggling at a church. Um, do you have any wisdom or anything that you can speak into for us? Because we're just trying to shepherd the youth workers that are in our area how could we do that well? Um, you have any advice for us? So like, I, can I put on my coaching hat for a second? Do it. Yes, please. I think there's such a high value of speaking truth to someone, mm. right? And that truth can be like really positive or it can be kind of hard to tell sometimes, but even the hard truths help a person grow. And the best leaders in the world are the most self-aware leaders. And every day I'm coaching leaders that are in their twenties that are not super self-aware, right? But we got to help them get to be self-aware leaders. And so doing that is sitting with people who've been in ministry for 20 plus years and being really honest with them. And then if you share hard truths, help them figure out the answers. Like, don't just dump on them like, hey, here's this, but I'm going to give you some resources and I'm going to follow up again with you next month. And let's talk about this and see where you've grown in this area. Right. And kind of walk with them. Um, encouragement goes a long way. A handwritten note goes a long way. Um, but I think youth workers in general just need to be supported, which is what you all do best. Right. That lonely piece um, is really real. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of youth workers out there that are solo. They've been handed a curriculum and they barely get to a network meeting because, and they don't feel worthy of being there. Y'all like you, they right. show up and they might be older than you. They might be younger than you, but they don't feel like they, they they're with the table with the big deal pastors who are actually getting paid for this. And so we all have an incredible amount of ability to speak life into people. So, yep. um, 
If I could take the word just and just remove it from our language, because when I hear youth workers who are volunteer youth workers or part-time, oh, I'm just, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. You are a shepherd and a pastor and you are leading these students to the feet of Jesus. What you're doing is never a just, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Charlie, we're going to throw people into breakouts. Uh, the three okay. questions that we have are, how do you encourage a volunteer leaders in your ministry? Just like now that we, now that you've shaken us up a little bit, we want them to start speaking some things because we want, you know, accountability and moving things into action. Uh, the second question is, what do you do or what do volunteer youth workers or youth leaders need to be effective? Might be a bigger question, but goes back to Charlie talking about the being a student of your area. And then um, how has your network reached out to volunteer youth leaders in your community? So would you add or change any of those questions, Charlie? I'm giving... Uh, Kevin just dropped them into the chat. So if you couldn't keep up with me, uh, but would you add or tweak any of those um, as we send people into breakouts? I think those are great. Cool. So um, uh, we're going to send you all into breakouts. We're, uh, we'll come back here for a wrap up and we'll give Charlie the last word. Um, and she'll probably pop into one of these breakouts. So uh, uh, take notes and then fill us in on all the extra truths that she drops. Feel free to pause the video here and think through these questions yourself or with the group that you're viewing this with. When you're ready, unpause to hear more of the conversation and the takeaways from the youth workers that joined us live. Hey, listen, our job here with Network Conversation is to start the conversation so that you can keep growing as, as leaders, all right? so that... I'm going to send you my travel bill to go to Lancaster and have some coffee with Josh. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the team, Jay. Welcome to the team. <laughs> so... Uh, well, so Jay and Josh, since you guys were dropping some hot truth right there, what were some of the things that were percolating for you in that conversation? Like share with the entire crowd. Don't hold it to yourself. Yeah, we were. Like, uh, yeah, good. Josh, you go ahead and speak because this is your deal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, we were we were sharing about uh, some things that worked, some things that different uh, didn't, some similar struggles and um, in in ministries and uh, how kind of COVID has affected connection, how we view connecting with people uh, and just trying to get right. It's we've noticed uh, for young life or for my ministry, we're a youth center of getting our volunteers to commit to the program, but getting them to commit to more than that, to building relationships with each other and connecting with students outside of that is like that. There's some hesitation there and uh, just some, how do we encourage and motivate our volunteers to do that is kind of the question that <laughs> we left with. So I felt like before COVID, I was always teaching students, how, like if, as a middle school, like camp speaker, I would say, hey, go make friends. But then they didn't know what to do. So I literally in my first session, I'd make them stand up and say, hi, my name is stick your hand out, shake hands with somebody and then hear what their name is. And then start looking them in the eye and having a conversation. And I made them do that. And everybody was like, that's so, I've never had a speaker do that before. But now I feel like we need to do that with our adult leaders, mm. right? Like you have to help them break the ice. How do you talk to a middle schooler? Because some of those, some of those people that are our adult leaders now are the ones that had problems as middle schoolers that I've been speaking to for years. So modeling, teaching. That's a really good insight. That's, that's really good. So, um, so, uh, what were some of the other things that you guys were listening to that you heard a friend say, not you, but you heard a friend say, Well, I just want to pop in. Mary did an amazing job of sharing. She's done, um, kind of volunteer liaison with schools in California is trying to work that up here in Utah. Mary, do you have like one or two things you want to share with the entire group of what it looks like? Kind of the idea of what does a volunteer need? 
Sure. Can y'all hear me on airplanes going overhead? Sorry. Okay. Hi. Uh, I lived in um, the Bay Area of California for 20 years. And about 18 of those years, I was kind of a liaison between our public schools and all of our youth pastors in our area. So anywhere from 12 to 17 churches that at that time had youth pastors and um and so i was also i i worked with the, the youth pastors as a group um and then at with the schools as as a volunteer coordinator of with the schools and then pulling the youth pastors in so ideally you find someone in your community who is a key volunteer every school has one whether if they have a if they don't have a PTA, it's the person who would normally be the PTA thing. I think when you get to um, especially when you get to high schools, um, you don't necessarily always have a PTA, and parents are off with whatever their kids are doing, right? Their whatever club or whatever sport. Um, but if you can find someone in your community, your church community, your family there that is on campus a lot already. And who knows their administration and is trusted by their administration, then you literally have a key to that school. Mike, I, I did this in California. So remember, they're crazy over there. Um, and I was still able to do this. And um, the one of the here's I'll give you a tip because I know that this has to be a national thing because it's a federal program. There's something called the um, I can't remember. It's called a site S-I-T-E, usually it's got a site committee, but there's federal, there's federal funds that come on to every public school and it's their discretionary funds. And you have to have a certain number of um, community members, part of that committee. And you're not on there to, I don't know, I could care less what they did with the money. It wasn't enough for me to, they already had their pre agendas and all of that. But it got me once a month at the table with the principal, mm. the vice principal, with the mm. other key parents, with some key teachers and with key students, because mm. all of those people needed to be at the table. And that was every single month that we would meet. And so for an hour and a half of my time every month, I had the ear of every single person that really mattered on that campus. Yeah, And when you do that for 18 years, so find somebody whose kids are in middle school and get them trained up to do this. Yeah, um, And I think that that's a, not just even that committee or that, that specific um, committee to be on, but get your parents who are, who are active, who naturally enjoy being around people and say, would you go do something on the school? Go join these meetings. I was called so many times. They knew I was a Christian. They knew I was going to talk about Jesus at every single meeting. Yeah. And yet the school board would still call me to ask me to sit on committees because they knew me and they trusted me. That's good. Right? Yeah. One of, the, one of the things that I've seen in my area is that the county and the community is looking for people who they want to volunteer. So that's a shift for us. We often want to vo want volunteers, but for us to put ourselves intentionally into a volunteer role could also help us appreciate our volunteers better and help give us clarity as leaders so really good stuff thanks mary so ross you also had three things that you dropped in the conversation about volunteers that were like it, that were very poetic and i already warned you that i was going to ask you to drop it <laughs> here as well so could you uh <laughs> share sure yes you did warn me um, and so uh, this is something that I learned from another leader years ago, and it's just, um, you know, held, I think, true for me. And so when you're when you're leading volunteers, um, you know, internally, they're they're sort of looking for three things or asking three questions, um, which are, uh, do you know where you're going? Do you know how you're going to get there? And will you love me along the way? And those first two questions are just sort of. Um, you know, maybe inspirational or, or comforting um, institutionally. But that third question, um, I mean, that's if they believe that you care about them and that you understand them and hear them, um, it can help. It helps people to get through the hard part of ministry. 
uh, because ministry, if you if you stick with it long enough, is always going to be hard somewhere along the line, um, and it could be any of a number of different things. But um, but it does help people to stick with it and to believe that God is going to use them um, in a significant way, and that that their volunteer time matters. Mm, that's good. Yeah. So I'm sure that we could have a lot more conversation. We've all had experience with volunteers. We could share stories of wonderfulness and then stories of like, don't do this with volunteers. <laughs> um, uh, and I hope the conversation continues beyond this. You know, you've carved out time for this, but uh, caring for volunteers well it takes intention and sometimes we forget to care for people unfortunately because we lit work in organizations and we don't you know some of us are wired as pastoral gifting and some of us have to be prodded to think as pastors so um so charlie as we're wrapping up here uh what last bit of wisdom is there something you heard in the in the breakout that you're like uh we need to end with this like i'm giving you the last word and then uh and then we'll let everybody uh, bounce if they need to. Yeah. What I heard in my breakout was how do I get buy-in from a ministry when you are a volunteer youth worker? Um, I actually spent a year being a volunteer youth worker and it was, uh, it was two years ago and I stepped in and was coaching the youth worker at one of my friend's uh, churches. And I love that senior pastor dearly, but the youth worker wasn't a good fit. So I helped her quit. <laughs> And so the youth worker, so the senior pastor was not happy with me. So I agreed to be the volunteer youth worker for the next year. Y'all, it was the hardest job I've ever had because when I come in, people listen to me. Like I've been doing this for a long time. I was, it was a different driving seat to be somewhere and people going, who are you? How do you even know what you're talking about? Like there was no buy-in. So I think um, if I was leading um, other volunteer youth workers, I would help them how to cast vision teach them what values are and how to develop them, right? And then so that you have a mission and a strategy. And I think helping other leaders do that is important um, because you can't lead when people don't trust you. Hmm. And your ministry only moves at the speed of trust, period, full stop with parents and volunteers and the congregation. So how do we best teach volunteer youth workers to do that? Yeah. And all of us who have leadership experience, hopefully mm -hmm. you can plug people into some resources. Hey, now y'all know Charlie and you can give them resources yeah. that Charlie recommended and you can be like my oh. good friend over there and look like a big deal because you know Charlie. So, um, but seriously, follow up with her if you have any questions. Yeah, she dropped her email. Um, I would lo and I'd love to give things away. <laughs> I try to be super generous as much as I can. So please let me know if you need something. I'd love to connect you with it. And if you're going to Orange, please go to her breakout, take notes, and then and then convince us to have her. It won't take much to convince us to have you back for another network conversation. But <laughs> um, but uh, thank you, thank you, Charlie, for taking your time out of your schedule to be a part of this. Um, if you want to hear a little bit more of, of Charlie's experience and um, some wisdom, uh, Free Refills podcast will drop next Monday. So watch out for that. Um, and uh, and next time we will have, uh, we're taking next month off, correct, uh, Kevin? Um so our staff is going to be uh, together and we got a lot of stuff going on. So we won't have a network conversations next month, but so in two months, watch for Kevin's emails and uh, Charlie just dropped her info on uh, the chat right there. So, uh, so we're so thankful for what you guys do in leading and coaching networks. And if you, once again, if you need any information, reach out to Charlie, reach out to us. We would love to help encourage you along the way because we know everything's here for massive revival. It's simply a matter of connecting the dots. And sometimes it's convincing Jesus followers that you're not in different teams. You're actually working for the same thing. And so thank you all for what you do and 
building that type of community, that John 17 community. And so uh, until next time, we are thankful for all that you guys do. We'll see you next time with the Network Conversations. And let me go ahead and pray for us real quick. Pray us out um, before I do that. We will do our next network conversation in two months. Is going to be on the state of youth ministry. We're going to have Terry Leinhart um, come and speak. Um, he, Bethel University. Um, they did a study on youth workers and how how are youth workers dealing with things these days? How are they doing? Um, could be an amazing time. That'll be in two months. Um, but let me pray for you all. And thank you, Charlie. Amazing. That was awesome. Jesus, thank you. Oh, I feel so encouraged to be surrounded by those who love you, who love to work with teenagers. And I just pray, Lord, that we can help better equip volunteers, be better volunteers ourselves, and just be able to see your vision, your direction, and encourage those around us to take the next steps and to do what they're equipped to do. So God, thank you for this time together. And I pray for all these amazing network leaders, youth leaders, give them encouragement and joy. Amen. Thanks for viewing this network conversation brought to you by the National Network of Youth Ministries. We hope it helps you to set the table for unity and further conversations with other youth leaders. Any shared links are in the comment section on NNYM's YouTube channel. While you're there, feel free to like and subscribe. If you want to join our next conversation or training, you can find upcoming live events on our Eventbrite page. You can also connect to a local network leader at nnym.org. We're here because we are better together.